Good afternoon. I call this oversight hearing to order. Today, the committee will hear directly from tribal leaders, practitioners specializing in native behavioral health and a native public health expert on opioid use disorder about the devastating impact of fentanyl in native communities. We'll also learn about specific culturally based practices, dedicated facilities and other promising tools native communities have developed and tailored to address their own needs. This is a really important conversation. Fentanyl, a potent synthetic opioid, is contributing to a rapid rise in opioid-related deaths across the country, and native communities are getting hit extra hard. From 2020 to 2021, American Indians and Alaska Natives experienced an alarming 33% rise in drug overdose deaths, the second uh, biggest of all groups in the United States. And Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders saw the largest increase at 47%. These overdose deaths rates are nothing short of staggering. In the past year, several tribes issued emergency declarations over the rate of fentanyl deaths among their members and accidental overdoses where users are unaware their drug of choice is mixed with fentanyl are also on the rise among American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. Last August, tribes from across the country came together to strategize on solutions and offer policy recommendations to address the fentanyl crisis in their own communities at the National Tribal Opioids Summit. White House officials, federal and state leaders, members of Congress, including Senator Cantwell, also participated. And I want to thank her for sounding the alarm and asking for today's hearing. This growing crisis is rooted in longstanding structural inequities in Native communities, lack of affordable housing, limited access to high-quality health care, and underfunded public safety programs compound fentanyl's impact on Native communities. Other unique factors such as checkerboard tribal lands, which create a jurisdictional maze for law enforcement, and a lack of available public health data further uh, complicate our response. It has been more than five years since we last held a hearing on the opioid e epidemic in Native communities. COVID-19 contributed to a significant increase in substance abuse and overdose, uh, uh, overdoses nationwide. And new threats from synthetic opioids, including fentanyl, have shifted the response paradigm. The time is now for the committee to re-engage. But our work doesn't end by simply identifying the problems. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. We have to listen to Native leaders, organizations, and healthcare providers and support Native-led solutions to fight fentanyl in their homelands and surrounding communities. So I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses today and thank them for uh, joining us in this important discussion. Uh, Vice Chair Murkowski for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do appreciate the fact that we're having this very important hearing in front of us today, and to Senator Cantwell, um, uh, thank you for, for making sure that it was scheduled here as we hold this hearing. Hopefully, it's the first in a series of, of how we respond, how we deal with, with what we have in front of us. You've, you've cited the statistics. It's, um, it's just really disturbing to know that among American Indians and Alaska Native populations, we see the highest drug overdose rates um, in the country for both 20 and 21 in terms of, of, of populations. Um, we've certainly seen it in Alaska, the significant increase in overdose and deaths due to fentanyl, due to opioids. Thanks to ANTHC's Epidemiology Center, we know that from 2018 to 2022, the annual number of opioid opioid deaths among Alaska Natives increased by 383%. During the COVID pandemic, opioid overdose mortality rate among Alaska Native people doubled. Um, very, very troubling article in our uh, statewide or our Anchorage paper, the uh, Anchorage Daily News on the 6th of, of November. And Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that uh, a full copy of this article be included as part of the record but it speaks to the, the situation that we're seeing in Alaska right now. This involved a, a drug ring operated within a prison. Um, but what, what the article states is during a 15-month period, 
uh, members in this ring sent 58.5 kilos of fentanyl. That's nearly 130 pounds of fentanyl to Alaskan communities. And they sent it to communities like Savunga, population 826 people. Like Tyonic, population 415 people. Like Good News Bay, New Stuyahawk, Togiak, Ketchikan, Dillingham, Sitka, islanded communities where the population is so small and predominantly native populations. And why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? Because they know that they can get 10 times more for this lethal poison that is being sent in. The comment that uh, was, was provided here, a dose of fentanyl that might sell in Anchorage for $15 could be worth $40 in Utkiavik, $80 in Kodiak, or $100 in Bethel. And so they are targeting these small, remote, rural, vulnerable communities. It is the worst of predation that can possibly be. Last year, the Alaska Federation of Natives approved a resolution calling for support for increased resources to combat the drug academic that we're seeing in our Alaska Native communities. It speaks to the lack of resources for education, for treatment, for preventative services, and public safety in Alaska Native communities. We are, we are working on so many different levels, but I think it's so important today to understand from our witnesses how they're specifically addressing fentanyl, whether it's tribal law enforcement investigations and seizures, more opioid treatment centers in rural communities, how we deal with the stigma that we know is attached. Um, I've introduced a bill that we call Bruce's Law to educate the public about the lethality of fentanyl, particularly with our youth. And then just last week, we introduced the telehealth response for e-prescribing addic addiction therapy services. We call it the TREATS Act. But it seeks to continue access of telehealth authorities when prescribing opioid treatment program medications. So lots to talk about. I want to welcome our Alaska witness, Mr. Eric Geddes. Um, he's going to be joined by Dr. Corey Cox during the question period of the hearing. Mr. Geddes is a senior VP for behavioral health at SEARCH in Juneau. And Dr. Cox is a dual board certified family medicine and addiction medicine physician also with SEARCH. He's currently working to expand access to quality addiction treatment services in rural Southeast Alaska. So pleased that they're going to be with us today with their input. Um, again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, I'll now recognize uh, Senator Cantwell, who has been a lead. A lot of members of, the, of this committee have been the leader on this particular challenge, but uh, Senator Cantwell was instrumental in making sure that this hearing happened. So, Senator Cantwell. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Schatz, and you and Vice Chair Murkowski for holding this very, very important hearing today to hear directly from Indian Country how they're fighting this battle and how they need a better federal partner. I want to take a moment to introduce. Uh, one of the witnesses, the chairman of the Lummi Nation, Anthony Hilaire. And I want to acknowledge the presence of multiple Lummi Nation leaders who are with us, key staffers, and council member Carly Kinley and Jim Washington. And in addition, the Lummi National Policy Advisor, Marissa Jones, recovery specialist, Tabitha Jefferson, and the Lummi Nation youth leaders who are here as a delegation. Thank you all for traveling all this way to make this voice heard and to get people to understand the scourge of this crisis. Your presence here today is a testament to the devastating impact the fentanyl crisis has had on the Lummi Nation. And when I visited Lummi Nation in October of last year, fentanyl was already taking its toll. But a year later, the Lummi community lost five people to fentanyl overdoses within one week. In 2022, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that American Indians and Nat Alaska Natives have the highest drug overdoses rate of any ethnic group for both 2020 and 2021. The rise of this illicit fentanyl is a problem. We have hosted nine roundtables throughout the state of Washington and have spoke at many of the organizational meetings to talk about what are the solutions. In fact, the National Tribal Opioid Summit was also held in the state. Uh, that was part of the, uh, organized by the National, uh, the Northwest 
Portland Indian Health Board and happen to have an alumni nation. But we've talked to tribal leaders in Spokane, Colville, Yakima, Cowlitz, Jamestown, the Puyallups, the Tulalips, and many people about how their particular communities are being impacted. What we know is we must increase treatment and recovery capacity. As one doctor told me, quote, we should have access to recovery be as easy as access to the drug. And at this point, it's not. We need to better educate young people and get them involved in prevention and recovery. And that is why I'm glad to see the youth delegation that is here today, because they can help us understand how we can better reach out to young people. The next generation can lead the way in educating their peers. And in August, as I spoke to the National Tribal Opioid Summit at Tulalip, a key theme raised by many of the officials gathered at the, uh, at the session was how understanding where illicit fentanyl is coming from and how we respond to it is a top priority. Data is needed and vital to our response in the pandemic and adequate resources, whether that is uh, helping them recognize the crisis or addressing it in responding is, is critical. But a few examples, the Jamestown Sklalem opened a healing clinic which provides addiction and MAT treatment and averages 120 patients per day. The Native Project in Spokane is working to build a youth and child services that will focus on tribal children's services to stay away from opioids and fentanyl. And the Lummi Nation opened a new stabilization and recovery center for their community members and are currently working to construct an open, and open a detox and healthcare center. So I welcome Chair Hilaire today to share the breadth and depth of your unique experience. And I'm so sorry that this is what the Lummi Nation has had to deal with. I know that you, as a tribal leader and a community council member in the past, know what it's like to deal with these issues and to prioritize them. Hopefully, we can work better together as a federal partner. I, I thank, again, uh, Madam Chair, the opportunity for this hearing to take place and hopefully our committee to come up with ideas to better help Indian country and our whole United States deal with this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cantwell. Any other members wishing to make an opening statement? Senator Hoven. Thank you, Ranking Member Murkowski. Um, I want to thank both you and Chairman Schatz, uh, as well as our witnesses, uh, for being here today this af uh, for being here this afternoon, and uh, appreciate the committee holding uh, this very important hearing on the impact of fentanyl in our tribal communities. And uh, it is, it's a huge problem uh, for the entire country. Uh, in essence, every state and, and uh, tribe as well has become a, a border state or border reservation because of the fentanyl that's pouring in over the southern uh, border. A lot of it, of course, originating uh, in China. So this is a problem we've got to address across the country. We're seeing record numbers of uh, overdose Yes, and of course, it's, a, it's a huge problem on the reservation as well. So again, I think it's, uh, and Senator Cantwell to you as well, uh, for the, everyone who said we need to have a hearing on this huge problem, they're right. We do, and we need to find ways to address it. We need to do that now. And so uh, again, I want to welcome all of our witnesses today, but I particularly would like to take a minute to welcome and to uh, introduce uh, Chairman Azure. Um, Jamie Osher is chairman of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. Uh, he attended the University of Minnesota, and we don't hold that against him in North Dakota. That's okay. Um, earned a Bachelor of Science degrees in both uh, business management and political science. Uh, he served on the Tribal Council since December 2016 and has been chairman since 2018. Uh, he continues to build up his community, foster economic development, and advocate on behalf of both tribal youth and elders. Um, he also serves on the United Tribes Technical College Board of Directors. He owns the J. Osher Construction uh, Company, and through his company is involved in community philanthropic efforts, such as dedicating a percentage of the company's profits to supporting youth organizations. Um, he resides in Belcourt with his wife, Denise, and their two children. And again, Chairman Aja, I want to thank you uh, for being here today, but even more than that, for the important work you do as, as, tri as chairman uh, for your tribes and uh, the good work that you do 
both through your company and as well as through your leadership as tribal chairman. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, yes, Senator. Yes, Madam Chair, pro tem. Thank, pro tem. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Hoven. <laughs> Uh, Senator Tester, I know yeah. you wanted to introduce uh, yep. your witness and maybe make I do. Point. I first want to thank you and the chairman for hosting this hearing that I think we can all uh, say is really important. And, and thank you, Senator Cantwell, for your leadership. I want to welcome everybody who's here testifying, uh, the folks who are here in person, the people who are here virtually. I also want to have a special uh, introduction for Councilman Bryce Kirk, who's here in the Indian Affairs Room, I think, for the first time. And uh, he is from the Fort Peck Assiniboine and Sioux Tribes, joining us from uh, that metropolis of Poplar, Montana, which is incredibly rural. And uh, Chairman Kirk is serving his second term of the Tribal Council. He sits on the Law and Justice Committee there, and also the Tribal Education Committee. Kirk knows firsthand the effects of fentanyl in his community, and he does important work combating this drug on the reservation. Uh, Bryce, it is an honor to have you here today uh, to testify to us. And uh, when your time comes up, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Senator Tester. Senator Lujan, did you care to make any comment? Madam Chair, thank you so much for this important hearing and the leadership of the committee and for each of you um, traveling to share these stories, um, to share your thoughts and your ideas of what needs to be done, of where there's negligence as well with lack of support or jurisdictions where there's questions where criminals learn to take advantage of them as well. But I certainly look forward to your testimony and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. We will now turn to our witnesses. Um, Senator Cantwell has has introduced our first, first witness, uh, Chairman Hilaire from the Lummi Nation. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Chairman Azure, who has been introduced by Senator Hoven uh, with the Turtle Mountain Band of the Chippewas. Uh, next, we will turn to Councilman Kirk, who has been introduced by Senator Tester from the Fort Peck Reservation. Uh, I understand that Dr. Uh, Akuhai Austin Seabury, Seabury uh, will be virtual with us. He is the executive director and licensed clinical psychologist at Iola Lahui Incorporated there in Honolulu. Uh, we will also be joined virtually by Mr. Eric Geddes, who is with Southeast Alaska Regional Health Consortium, as I is, have introduced previously. He will be accompanied by Dr. Corey Cox, a uh, clinical director for addiction services also there at search. And then our final witness will be uh, Clara Dina Soto, a PhD, associate professor, Department of Population and Public Health Sciences at the Keck School of Medicine at UCLA. I want to remind our witnesses that your full written testimony will be made part of the official record, so we would ask that you try to keep your comments to no more than five minutes so members have an opportunity to ask questions. But we realize that these, uh, these comments uh, that you make are very important uh, and the information that we will gain today is exceptionally important. So for those of you who have made the trip to be here, thank you. And for those of you who are giving your time online, thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Hilaire, if you will proceed, please. Heishka, Siam Nisjalicha, Tony Hilaire, Sunat Snet, Satsum Tin Sunat Snet, Chuck Lummison. My dear friends and relatives, my name is Tony Hilaire. My name is Satsumton. I come from Lummi, and I serve as the chairman of the Lummi Indian Business Council. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Vice Chair uh, Murkowski and, and um, uh, Chair, Chairman Schatz and the uh, distinguished uh, members of this committee. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having us here today. I am uh, here with my team here. Thank you, Senator, for uh, introducing them. Uh, we are uh, traveling from afar, from uh, Lummi Nation located in Washington State. And we're here on behalf of our, our great Lummi Nation. We're here on behalf of our, our ancestors, our elders, our, our children, our fishermen, our fisherwomen, but most of all, and, and most importantly, we are here on behalf of the grieving grandmothers and, and mothers uh, who are burying their children to, to drug overdose. And it's becoming uh, way, way too normalized. And uh, uh, just yesterday, we had a, a funeral of a 26-year-old 
a Lummy woman who uh, passed away from drug overdose, leaves behind two children that uh, will grow up with now without a mother. And uh, these aren't just uh, uh, anyone to us. These are our family. These are the people we grow up with. Th these are our future chairmen and chairwomen, our future cultural leaders, language speakers, the ones who will carry the torch uh, into the next generations. Uh, we want to thank you, uh, this committee, uh, for, for holding this hearing so we can discuss this important matter so that we can change the world for the better uh, for these next generations. And a special thank you to, to Senator Cantwell, our, our dear friend, uh, for your immediate response. Uh, when we had uh, uh, five deaths within three days at, at Lummi Nation, four of them being drug overdose, uh, Senator Cantwell helped respond immediately and, and gave us some assistance. In addition to calling this hearing, and as well as for introducing the, the parity uh, for Tribal Law Enforcement Act, as well as attending the National uh, Fentanyl Summit uh, hosted at, at Tulalip uh, Tribes. Uh, thank you for standing with us and for your, your ongoing uh, friendship. Uh, I want to start real quick just acknowledging our resilience uh, as Lummi people when we talk about these issues and the drastic uh, scenes of uh, this fentanyl crisis at home that goes without saying how resilient we are as a people and that we are self-determining, that we want to take care of ourselves and that we know how to do that. Uh, the, these impacts of uh, fentanyl and opioids uh, at home have been uh, very drastic and very overwhelming. And I just ask rhetorically to the committee just how many funerals have you been to in the last year? How many have you been to in the last uh, month, in the last week? And for us, it's pretty much every day. And that's not just for fentanyl uh, overdose, which has been completely devastating, but also uh, all of the health disparities that we see at Lummi Nation that we're, we are up against. Uh, we, uh, we don't have time to meet. And uh, I understand that it's much needed, but right now our people need leadership. They need hope. And that is our responsibility to ensure that we never take away hope from our people. And so when we had those deaths and when I was talking to Senator Cantwell, uh, we, we responded immediately at Lummi Nation. We declared a state of emergency. Uh, we implemented checkpoints to, to limit the amount of drugs that were coming onto our reservation. We got canine units. Uh, Senator Cantwell helped us get FBI agents who helped get us get drugs off of the street. That was the first response was immediate action is the best message to the mothers who are grieving uh, at Lummi Nation. And so we did just that. As we uh, continued to intervene, we are learning the, the need for better outreach, uh, better um, uh, treatment services. The more drugs we get off the street, the more we disrupt the, the, the market of drugs. Uh, our people, the, those that struggle with addiction are really needing uh, that fix. And so uh, we opened up a stabilization center, uh, which is a expansion of services for medication assisted treatment and is open 24 seven. And since our drug interdiction efforts, the beds have been completely full. In addition to that, uh, we've noticed children being in the homes of where we found drugs and where we shut down drug homes. And that brings up the need for our Lummi Youth Academy, which is a, a residential uh, facility next to our uh, Lummi Nation school that ensures that our children can be home, that they can uh, be uh, close tied to, to our, our people, our culture, and our way of life um, as a, as a way of ensuring prevention. And then uh, finally, uh, our need for a detox facility uh, as an immediate need right now. The severity of withdrawals to fentanyl is uh, really concerning. And right now we have plans to build uh, a detox facility, but through the bureaucracy and through the lack of funding resources, it's been really challenging. We've raised $15 million over the last few years at lobbying for this very uh, issue, and uh, uh, we need $12 million more to, to finish the project. Uh, there, there's so much more to this. Uh, more time is needed for, the, for uh, really, really grasping and getting into the weeds of, of what needs to be done. Uh, but those are the three top priorities for Lummi Nation. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. So appreciate your testimony. We'll next turn to Chairman Azure. Good afternoon, uh, Vice Chairman Murkowski and uh, committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present testimony at today's hearing entitled Fentanyl in Native Communities, Native Perspectives on Addressing the Growing Crisis. 
Uh, my name is Jamie Azure. I am an enrolled member of the Turner Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians and chairman of the tribe. It is an honor to be here with you today. According to the Centers for Disease Control, nationwide over 150 people die every day from overdoses related to synthetic opioids like fentanyl. In 2020 alone, there were over 56,000 people who died of fentanyl overdose. This threat is real all over the United States and in my home state of North Dakota. According to recent statistics from the North Dakota Department of Health and Human Services, there also have been significant increases in overdose deaths. The fentanyl and opioid overdose death rate has steadily increased from 2019, where one individual per 10,000 died of an opioid or fentanyl overdose, to 2022, where two per 10,000 in North Dakota have passed away. On average, two North Dakotans die each week from opioid and fentanyl overdoses, with the highest percentages of those deaths coming from Native Americans. That's right, in North Dakota, home of five tribes, Native Americans die at a rate of almost nine individuals per 10,000. More alarming and closer to home, in Benson County, North Dakota, has seen one of the largest increases of fentanyl and opioid deaths in the state at almost two times higher than the state's average, and those numbers continue to tick upwards as we end 2023. Within the Turtle Mountain Reservation, we also have seen family members perish at the hands of this deadly poison. In response, we have set up several drug task forces that work with state and local authorities to stop this drug trafficking before it reaches our communities. For example, last year, the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa authorized its own tribal division of drug enforcement, the DDE, with tribal resources. We hired a director who, along with law and policy department, formulated policy and procedures to get the DDE operational. We hired some experienced staff and became effective in March of 2023. As of today, we have four staff on this team. Prior to this, we had to rely on BIA, OJS's drug unit agents. At one point, we relied on one agent among five North Dakota reservations. As you can imagine, this was ineffective. This was far too large of an area to assign to one drug agent. Since March of 2023, we have had four major met or fentanyl drug busts. The DDE stopped a large quantity of drugs from reaching our people. We utilized tribal intelligence and we were able to intercept large shipments before they were on the streets of the community. Please understand that these shipments are coming mostly from the Detroit metropolitan area and sometimes as far as Las Vegas. In intercepting these shipments, we coordinated with state and federal partners for arrests coming off Amtrak in Rugby, North Dakota, around 40 miles from the Turtle Mountains. Please note that all these drug shipments are from non-Indians delivering to our reservations. We have also learned that our law enforcement efforts that these drug dealers often move into our HUD units with promises of wealth and drugs that proceeds for our vulnerable populations. These individuals have significantly disrupted the lives of our children, resulting in foster parents when the parents are arrested. Also note that these drug dealers are also using social media platforms such as Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, and more. Because of the effective effectiveness of the DDE, the drug dealers are complaining about loss of profits and reduction of supply. I am hopeful that we continue to develop effective partnerships with the state and federal agencies, but let me be clear, the BIA Office of Justice Services must step up their job. As the committee has been made aware, we have been strapped with limited BIA law enforcement resources. For example, the Bureau of Indian Affairs law enforcement continues to shift away resources from the Turtle Mountains. In fact, BIA law enforcement has recently shifted away our chief of police to work elsewhere. And I, as tribal chairman, wasn't even notified. I found out by a text from the chief of police asking if I was notified. These decisions have made Turtle Mountain members less safe. Can you imagine if a major city such as Detroit or Chicago law enforcement were suddenly transferred someplace else? What kind of message would that send? I want to take a moment to thank Senator Hoven for looking into this important matter for us. Hopefully, the Senator can get answers from the Department of Interior before any more tribal members are victims of crime or drug overdose. I would also like to take a moment and offer my continued support for the following. Number one, 465 dash badges sponsored by Senator Cortez Masto and Senator Hoven. This bill will help 
expedite background checks for BIA law enforcement so they can get hired more ex expeditiously. Part of the problem of hiring law enforcement is how long it takes to go through the background process. It should not take nine to 12 months. Uh, number two, advanced BIA law enforcement training centers at Camp Grafton, North Dakota. This training center is the only BIA law enforcement training center located in the Great Plains region. This training helps those communities that cannot send their police officers all the way to New Mexico and allows for specialized investigation classes occurring such as drug interdiction classes. And number three, keeping the drug elimination program in the Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination Act, NAHASDA funding, which is currently in the Senate version of the National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA. This program will allow my community to utilize housing dollars to provide drug treatment services, rehabilitation, education, and relapse prevention in a cultural manner. In closing, I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak uh, to this important subject and look forward to uh, answering any questions that may come after. But I would also like to mention that on behalf of the tribal leadership that is sitting at this table, that is watching, that is sitting here in support, this committee needs to remember that we took a vow to sit in the chairs that we sit in, in the leadership roles that we have taken on for that next generation. We are very close at losing a generation to an opioid, to a synthetic drug. We need to figure out a way that we can work together to address a lot of these issues that are gonna be brought up today and a lot that we don't have time to get into. It's not in my nature to read off the paper that I just read off, but it was important to get the right facts across. These are our children. These are the next generation. Like Chairman Hilaire had mentioned earlier, these are the next round of leaders that we are fighting for. We as tribal leaders refuse to allow a generation to be lost. I just wanted to get that point across. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Councilman Kirk. Hi, I'm Bryce Kirk, Councilman for the Fort Peck and Wen and Sioux Tribes on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation. I'd like to thank the committee, uh, Vice Chair Murkowski, um, for allowing me to testify on fentanyl in our communities. I'll start off with a story of, uh, you know, a couple brothers that I had that I've lost because of fentanyl that leave behind both entail six kids, a wife, two wives, and continued kids that continue to lose their parents. When I was coming in the door, I remember a young lady that I coached in eighth grade and seventh and eighth grade in basketball. And right now she's a ninth grader addicted to fentanyl right now today. As we continue to be here and as we continue to sit here, fentanyl has no boundaries. It affects men, women, children, and the elderly from all walks of life. People deal drugs, including the Suboxone, to pay for their own habits to deal who will buy to feed their habits. Our people can go to Spokane with $1,000 and bring 1,000 pills back and make $120,000 off of those pills. This is destroying families. We have higher crime rates and increased violence, rapes, murders, kidnappings. Suicide remains a large leading cause of our people. Where did we get that it's okay for people to continue to lose their loved ones walking in front of trains, that it's just okay for them to deal with the pain that they have dealt with their whole lives? and stuffing it down with drugs, deadly drugs, just to feed the pain that they feel growing up, the abuse, sexually, physically, emotionally, abuse that no kid, no person should ever go through. I myself am a recovered addict, been clean and sober 11 years, and now elected to our tribal council to be able to lead our people and fight for our people. While the crisis is daunting, it is not hopeless. I'm, you know, I'm there with them 
but a mentor also. Before I got on the council, I had a business that actually helped people come off the streets that were just like myself to reach down and start reaching our people that we have an obligation. And that in the end of our swearing in ceremony, we say, so help me God. As you guys take an oath, we take an oath too. This ain't just a red, a blue issue. This issue is everybody. It contains our kids. We in Fort Peck have lost a generation of kids right now. And we got grandkids taking care of great grand, we got grandparents taking care of great grandchildren because the grandchildren that they were taking care of are now lost in the addictions that we face today. What we need is more law enforcement. We need, we don't need doors slammed in our face when we try to reach out to our federal partners. We need them opened. We need to be able to work together with information that they have with people coming onto our reservation. We need more mental and behavioral health. You know, one of the biggest things is, you know, there's always talk about funding. There can never be enough funding to catch up where we're at. And it's sad to say that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Without the help of federal governments and, and Congress and, and acts that we need on reservations to be able to help support our people, we need the direct funding to come to our tribes, to come to our reservations, to where we know what it takes. Us as leaders, we know what, what our people need. We know traditional ways that that our people need to go to need, we could lead our people there. We need jobs and training for our people. We need more housing. We need more community facilities. One of the biggest things in conclusion is my wife and I are a testament to this here. And no matter what happens, we as Indian people are resilient and will continue to come out of this as we always have. But we need additional support from all parts of the federal government. And we need federal agencies to be true partners with us in this effort. We don't need bureaucrats in DC telling us how to solve the problem. We already have the blueprint for how to solve the crisis in the way that is best for our communities, which is informed by our experiences on the ground and successes we have already achieved. What we need is support and tools to grow our efforts and start helping us reach the people that are already lost. So that way we don't lose any more grandparents, grandchildren, moms, dads, kids, kids that haven't even graduated yet. And I thank you for the time. I thank you for everything and hopefully we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kirk. Uh, next, I am pleased to introduce and welcome online Dr. A. Aukahi Austin Seabury, PhD, Executive Director and Licensed Clinical Psychologist, E. Ola Lahui, Incorporated in Honolulu, Hawaii. Welcome, uh, Dr. Seabury. Aloha, my Kako. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, mahalo nui no ke ia kono ana mai. Thank you so much for this welcome. Um, uh, I, uh, in Hawaii, in, in Hawaii, we have a saying about um, health is being contained in the kihi eha o kikino, the four corners of the body, speaking about the two shoulders and the two um, sides of the hips as holding the most vital organs. And so if, um, if this convening is about all of America and the continent, then Hawaii represents um, the right hip. And so welcome and greetings from that part of the vital organs of the country. Um, Aloha, it's, it's a pleasure to speak with you and to, uh, I feel a lot of gratitude for the time today um, to be among my uh, brothers, sisters and cousins um, throughout the country um, who are coming to speak today about the First Nations people. Um, we are in a um, we are in an important time and, and all of us being able to gather together to uh, speak about the needs of our specific communities is very critical to this moment, especially as the speaker before me was sharing, because of how important it is that we contribute 
um, the ways in which our specific uh, traditional wisdom has been uh, a promising factor in recovery for people in, 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 in healing and, and well-being, that those solutions that come from our traditional cultural practices and worldview um, have been shown to be so vital to how this is all going to work. And so Native-led, Native Voices um, is the sort of resounding call from across um, all of these parts of the world. And so I am appreciative to be able to join the voices in that way. Um, a little bit about the porch I'm speaking from. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist by training and run a nonprofit organization whose focus is on culturally minded, evidence based behavioral health services for Native Hawaiian, medically underserved, and rural communities. Um, and I've spent my career in the service of my people as a therapist, as a healer, specifically um, as an advocate and a program builder, and someone who builds and maintains relationships um, as a Hawaiian health leader. Um, and so what I share today is informed by my patients that I serve and the communities that I've listened to and been a part of um, and the community partners that I've maintained and their sharing of their experience of this. So um, the parts I probably don't need to spend too much time on are that there are similar factors that affect um, the First Nations peoples across the world, such as cultural and historical trauma, systemic bias and marginalization that's going on currently, and of course the social determinants that directly impact all of our health outcomes, outcomes including economics and housing. Um, in Hawaii specifically, we have a really um, big housing crisis occurring at the moment, as well as very significant impacts uh, or threats to our uh, fresh water sources. And so all of those things being factors that predict um, the higher rates of substance use and misuse in the native community here, um, probably in some ways parallel what occurs in other uh, First Nations. Um, you know, and that, and that those, um, those trends tend to be over time. If, if fentanyl follows the same path as opioids had and meth had before that, that what we tend to see is that um, we follow behind the continent a few years. So where, um, um, where everyone else is at the, is maybe what I'm hoping is the peak of the fentanyl, the impacts that you're at that sort of crisis state. In Hawaii, we're seeing that increasing and rising trend. I don't believe that we're yet at the peak that we will see for this particular substance. And so um, if, if we are to believe that it's going to follow the same path, that's what we can predict, is that because um, we saw cases, cases initially among individuals who had acquired fentanyl um, for prescription prescriptive purposes, right? That, that it was part of their care plan and, and that misuse and death was, was following along with um, a lack of information about the risks um, of its use. And then of course, into that sort of misuse category. And then seeing fentanyl as mixed in with other substances as a street drug, that's following behind, but not reached its sort of um, um, influx, at least in my experience in the communities that I work in, it's not yet at that peak widely accessible um, utilization component just yet. So we're not seeing as many. Now we are seeing opioid deaths, of course, but the rise, we're still on that increasing arc at this time. And so my hope is that participating in this conversation today, we're talking, um, in two categories. One, of course, is about preventive strategies to help us not follow the way that each of the other um, substances has followed across the country from the continent to us in Hawaii to prevent that and sort of stay it off. Um, because as you can imagine, in our, our health system is finite. Uh, we're an isolated island nation. And in that way, we have the health um, and substance services that are available. They are all that exist. And so it's vital um, for us. So with respect to prevention and intervention, there are some very specific things um, that I would focus on. Um, and those are that for some of our community, standard evidence-based Western practices work fine. Um, but for the some, for the everybody else, that something else seems to be real promise in the use of cultural practice as part of healing and recovery. Um, that those programs that have emphasized those things seem to have really um, wonderful outcomes. And we have even some in, uh, third party insurers that have been experimenting with models for how to fund it. So with respect to an ask of this committee, it's to support those initiatives that find ways to fund through Medicare, Medicaid funding, because our uh, third party insurers tend to follow those as the leaders, that they fund and find mechanisms for funding traditional cultural practice as a vital aspect of healing for our communities. 
Um, and so I would say that that's probably the greatest ask that I would have of this committee with respect to different than the other requests that have already been made with respect to supporting um, prevention initiatives that include education for health providers more generally, both in the risks um, and appropriate use and, of course, misuse of fentanyl, as well as the value add and necessity of culturally informed care, as well as the use of traditional cultural practices for healing and, and well-being as part of the inclusive health system, instead of as sort of viewed as marginal the way that it has been historically. That for our community in particular, our folks would much rather see a traditional healer than a, than a Western medical doctor, um, especially our men. And so um, in that way, that this could be um, legitimized and valued in our community. We need that training for our health system and providers alongside support um, and funding mechanisms for the programs that are already using cultural practices as healing. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Seabury. Mahalo. Uh, uh, Senator Murkowski, did you? Okay, so uh, uh, Mr. Geddes, please uh, proceed with your testimony. Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, members of the committee and those who have spoken so expertly and passionately today, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the issues of fentanyl the opioid crisis, and the impact on Native communities. My name is Eric Geddes. I serve as Senior Vice President for Behavioral Health at Southeast Alaska Regional Health Consortium, known as SEARCH. SEARCH is an Alaska Native-controlled tribal organization. We are authorized by the resolutions of 15 federally recognized Alaska Native tribes to administer comprehensive health care delivery for the Tlingit, Haida, Simshian, and other residents of Southeast Alaska. Founded in 1975, SEARCH is one of the oldest and largest native-run health organizations in the nation with a service area stretching over 35,000 square miles. SEARCH is accredited by the Joint Commission and operates two critical access hospitals, two long-term care facilities, and 22 rural community health centers. <laughs> The decades-long opioid crisis has impacted communities across the United States, and multiple studies confirmed here today uh, show that Alaska Native and American Indian people are disproportionately impacted by opioid use, opioid-related overdose, and opioid-related deaths. The Native communities of Southeast Alaska continue to suffer through the heartache and despair brought about by substance use. SEARCH has addressed opioid use disorder over the past 10 years by significantly reducing opioid prescriptions, promoting holistic interventions for pain management, implementing harm reduction services and activities, and providing buprenorphine and naltrexone throughout the region. Recognizing more services were needed. In February 2022, SEARCH opened an opioid treatment program or OTP in Juneau. OTPs are the only facilities that offer patients all three forms of medication for opioid use disorder, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. No other setting is permitted to provide methadone. OTPs are critical to reducing overdose deaths and providing life-saving addiction treatment. In the past year, SEARCH added two additional OTPs in Sitka and in Klawak. Before these programs opened, those with opioid use disorder had to physically move hundreds of miles away to Anchorage or Seattle to engage in treatment. Our programs have dramatically improved people's lives, yet serious challenges remain. Fentanyl has rapidly re replaced prescription opioids and heroin as the primary driver of opioid misuse in Southeast Alaska. Fentanyl is profoundly potent, quickly physically addictive, easily attainable, and has a very short half-life leading to escalating quantities of use and lethality. This has led to yet another widespread wave of opioid use resulting in more overdoses and preventable deaths. We consistently find patients developing dependence on fentanyl over relatively short periods of time. It is essential that treatment and medication for opioid use disorder be available and expanded. 
The COVID pandemic allowed several longstanding OTP regulations to be eased. These revised rules improved treatment availability by permitting telemedicine and allowing prescribers more clinical discretion for some methadone take-home administration. Search wholeheartedly supports maintaining these relaxed emergency regulations. However, there are efforts around the country seeking to ease methadone regulation even further. We urge great caution with these proposals and recommend that methadone remain part of a comprehensive opioid treatment program. Access to and availability of harm reduction services and overdose reversing medications is paramount for saving lives. Oftentimes these medicine medication supplies are limited. Additionally, preconceived beliefs about substance use and associated stigma prevent harm reduction services from being accepted in some communities. Changing our words and descriptions, helping communities reframe beliefs and realizing that people can and do recover are all essential components to battle stigma. Finally, as a nation, we must recognize the necessity of developing a strong behavioral health workforce. Native communities across Alaska continually struggle with inadequate staffing. Behavioral health specialists and peers have long operated in an under-resourced system that discourages many from entering or remaining in the field. Effective treatment requires qualified, compassionate professionals grounded in culturally responsive practices and relationships. These are the fundamental elements that foster healing and recovery. In conclusion, Search truly appreciates the opportunity to speak before the committee today on this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Geddes. And our, la our last witness will be Dr. Soto. Thank you for joining the committee today. Thank you for having me. Uh, before I begin, I would like to make a correction that I am from the University of Southern California. I know it's a rivalry to UCLA, but that's okay, as I know my, actually my daughter is there at UCLA. <laughs> but I'm Claridina Toya, or Soto Toya. I am an urban Indian born and raised in the East Bay area of California. I'm Navo from my mother's side and Hamas Pueblo from my father's side. Thank you, Chairman Schatz and Vice Chairman Murkowski and all the members of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs for this opportunity to address to you today about the fentanyl crisis that is killing my people. In my written testimony, I offered information about this critical issue, the work that we are doing specifically in California, reaching tribal and urban Indian populations, and several policies that fall within the scope of your committee's duty to address the issues affecting our Native people today. I would like to mention that the work here in California our, our populations are very unique and diverse. We have the largest American Indian and Alaska Native population than any other state. We have 109 federally recognized tribes in California, as well as numerous state recognized tribes and non-federally recognized tribes, plus a large uh, urban Indian population. So today I would like to discuss how American Indian and Alaska Native communities face unique challenges and vulnerabilities that have contributed to the opioid crisis. And I'd like to offer four recommendations to the committee. This is based on our community engaged research work with community organizations, tribal governments, Indian health clinics, and our community advisory boards. We understand that effective change requires a deep understanding of both the challenges faced by and strengths inherent to our native communities. And I would like to note my recommendations may vary by community and when implementation is considered, it should be decided by each community. So my first recommendation and this has been shared by others, is to increase the accessibility, quality, and sustainability of residential detox and sober living facilities for tribal and urban Indian populations. We need residential treatment programs in counties and tribal communities with high opioid use and overdose deaths. Discussions with our leaders and stakeholders must immediately happen to expand Native-specific and culturally-centered services, especially among regions where no uh, recovery services exist. We must expand medication-assisted treatment, MAT, also known as Medication for Opioid Use Disorder. Yes, this is the use of medication in combination with counseling and behavioral therapy, and that is essential to support and promote opioid use recovery. So as we think about this critical infrastructure, this is important in the treatment life cycle for opioid use disorders. So there is a need for detox and sober living homes serving our Native community. 
And one of the critical one of the critical components missing from the Indian healthcare network, particularly here in California, is detox and that coordinate on a system level with Indian health clinics. And when individuals graduate from a residential or other outpatient treatment program, sober living and traditional housing for American Indian and Alaska Natives are critical to providing a safe, culturally centered recovery experience for individuals to integrate recovery tools into their home and community settings. My second recommendation is to integrate cultural modalities into recovery treatment programs. This includes, but is not limited to, healing ceremonies such as prayers, smudging, sweat lodges, and meeting with traditional healers that offer safe, sober, and supportive spaces to gather and express traditional ways of healing. Studies have found that many Native community members do strongly favor traditional healing over strict medication use, and that have indicated that healing begins with culture and with practices that are grounded in our traditional way of life. So access to these approaches and practices and healing for patient wellness at one of the most is one of the most critical junctures in the recovery cycle of change. This is very paramount. My third recommendation, um, again, is also mentioned by others, is to focus on our Native youth in urban and rural areas with community-based and culturally relevant opioid use prevention and treatment services. According to CDC in 2021, Native adolescents experienced the highest overdose deaths from fentanyl due to the increased availability of illicit fentanyl, again, highlighting the need for harm reduction education and greater access to naloxone and mental health services. Specifically, there is a need for youth rehab programs to treat and reduce uh, opioid use disorders. We must use family cohesion, culture and traditional practices, and culturally based youth programs as protective factors against our youth engaging in opioid substance use. Fourth recommendation, my last, is to address the challenges of collecting reliable data for our populations to ensure accurate demographic data and respect the cultural and ethnic identities of our Native people. All too often, we are racially misclassified, especially in urban areas where we are assumed to belong to another ethnicity based on appearance. We are not invisible and we must improve our data collection methods and collaborate with tribal governments and native organizations that are working on these data issues to advocate for policies that provide data collection and representation of our native communities. This will help us determine our impact in addressing the opioid epidemic in Indian country. Thank you so much for your time and this opportunity to share. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for allowing me to uh, proceed with the questioning. I wanted to talk about uh, law enforcement specifically, since several of the chairman and council members brought that up. Um, I, I, I want to say at the uh, opioid summit held by the um, the Portland Northwest Portland office that it was at, at uh, Tulalip, I see some fascinating treatment work being done by Indian country, holistic, simplistic, and certainly responsive to on-reservation focus. So I don't want to diminish that side of the equation, but what I feel and hear, uh, particularly Mr. Chairman uh, from the Lummi, is that without uh, the adequate tribal law enforcement resources, I almost feel like Indian country is being targeted that people know that you don't have the law enforcement, that you don't have the capabilities, and that's where people are setting up shop. And then consequently, what's happening is the most powerful, the money is so good everywhere that the drug is just being made as quick as possible and as powerful as possible, and people don't even know the impact of it. And the consequence is you had, uh, I'm, not, I'm not clear if it was four or five deaths, but you had five deaths, four related to this in, in one week. So Mr. Chairman Azur mentioned the fact that he wants help from the BIA Justice Law Enforcement. And in, in your case, we tried to partner with the FBI, but that was even, I'm not saying kludgy, but there are issues of how you all coordinate and how we get the FBI to come out and do a bust with you because you had to get that product off your reservation. You knew how deadly it was and you had to respond. But who were you calling? Who were you calling to get to help you respond uh, to this crisis? So I want to know, um, Senator Mullen and I have introduced the Parity for Tribal Law Enforcement, uh, a self-determination contract for federal law enforcement officers, making them eligible for benefits as a way to try to build capacity on reservations. But what are the two or three things we need to do to help right away 
with better law enforcement tools for Indian country to help fight this? And if I could hear from each of the uh, three tribal chairs here. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Senator. And uh, again, thank you to the uh, the committee for, for holding this hearing. Uh, yeah, uh, law enforcement is a, is a big issue. And um, uh, not only that, uh, the, the severity of this drug and us being a close-knit community, just one, the smallest amount is deadly to us and impacts our uh, future generations. So um, it, it's, it's a really serious problem. And at, at Lummi Nation, we, we come against uh, issues that uh, pertain to jurisdiction, especially when we have a reservation that is a peninsula, a road that goes, we call it going around the horn at Lummi Nation and uh, surrounded by water. And the road has a right of way uh, by the county, uh, which is an access road for non-tribals living on fee land, as well as for the Lummi Island Ferry residents, which is not uh, reservation land. And so what do we do when we implement checkpoints and we have somebody who is non-tribal and there's no reasonable cause and uh, they're uh, bringing drugs onto a reservation? And uh, it's, it's always an ongoing issue. And I want to back up just, just a little bit uh, before uh, I mention a little bit more on, on some of the law enforcement thing. Um, this is a, a leadership issue. And even just based on, on everything we've heard in this short amount of time, we can already see the complexity of how, how we're supposed to address it. it. It is law enforcement, it is prevention, it is intervention, it is re rehabilitation, it is workforce, it is housing. It, you know, there, there's so much to this. And I think uh, a way for us to ensure that we have resources uh, in the area of law enforcement uh, being one of them is that the the United States declare a, an emergency, a, a national emergency uh, to fentanyl. That way we can tear down uh, the barriers, tear, tear down the, the bureaucracy, everything that's hindering our ability to take care of our people. Ensure that I, we don't have to compete with our brothers and sisters across Indian country for a grant that helps us uh, with law enforcement through DOJ or through other uh, program services to ensure that uh, we don't have such extensive uh, reporting systems to ensure that uh, we have direct funding because as you can hear, we know how to take care of ourselves. Uh, but going back to, to enforcement, I think um, uh, we definitely need more resources in uh, BIA, DEA, and the FBI. Uh, the lack of uh, prosecutions uh, from DOJ and local authorities uh, we also need the ability to prosecute and hold accountable uh, non-Indian drug dealers who are murdering our people uh, through this drug, uh, fentanyl and carfentanyl and all the various versions of it. Uh, the lack of the, the tribal jurisdiction uh, over non-Indian drug dealers uh, coming onto a reservation undermines our, our efforts to combat the drug crisis and, and protect our community. And we urge uh, co Congress to... Uh, recognize a special criminal jurisdiction uh, over non-Indians who committed drug offenses in our communities. And I, um, I'm sure we'll see more through the, the act that is being introduced. And, um, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, a, a, right now we do everything we can to exert our sovereignty, to protect our, our children. You know, we have this, this very scary image of uh, car fentanyl, which seems to be reaching our, our smaller communities, which is 100 times stronger than, than regular fentanyl, 10,000 times stronger than morphine. And if, if, if it is sitting on a, a coffee table where there are children, then we have to get this drug off of our reservation. And so right now we're doing everything that we can with the resources that, that we have. With the, the ability of getting the FBI agents to Lummi Nation, we work closely with them. We got over 4,500 pills uh, off of the reservation just within a few days with that, the checkpoints and canine units. And so we're, we're going to keep going, doing everything we can, uh, but it does come down to uh, a matter of, of resource and um, brings up the uh, uh, what we mentioned earlier when we uh, go into drug interdiction, when we get over 4,500 pills off of the road. Uh, our beds become full uh, at our stabilization center. And that's why, you know, there's so many different pieces to this. But if we start with uh, the highest level possible that 
The United States of America declares this a, a national emergency. Uh, I believe that, that we can overcome a lot of the barriers that we're, we're facing. Aishka, thank you. I know my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, so um, I'll either take it for the record or you can give them 30 seconds, whatever. Go ahead. Go ahead. I didn't know if they wanted to respond quickly. 30 seconds. I know that's not a lot of time to respond to this. Uh, sure, and I, I want to thank uh, Chairman Hilaire for hitting the major points, but uh, to break it all down, what we're asking for are resources that cannot be taken away. Uh, I know I'd mentioned earlier with the detailing of our law enforcement. The uh, it, it, Let's just be honest, in the, the state of North Dakota, we have five tribes and one FBI agent. And we do understand that, uh, that violent crimes will take that FBI agent to a different case, and, and it prolongs the uh, the cases and the investigations. And uh, right now, the Bureau is currently sitting on a mutual aid agreement that we had uh, brought forward that is still sitting on. That is why I mentioned earlier that the Turtle Mountains have moved forward in self-determining our own tribal drug task force because we can't wait anymore. And I, I speak on behalf of all tribes that we refuse to wait anymore and we'll do what we can to save our next generations. Thank you. Vice Chair Murkowski. Oh, sorry. No, just, just real quick. Councilmember Kirk, excuse me. No problem. Uh, you know, one of the things for me is Amtrak. You know, right now Amtrak flows right through reservations in Montana. When do we become sovereign and be able to inflict that when it comes through our reservations? I can go as John Tester to Spokane without an ID and somebody just buys me a ticket and they scan it off my phone. When, when are we going to be able to put drug dogs and enforce those as soon as that Amtrak hits our reservation boundaries. As we continue to, as we continue to battle that, the other thing, just at the Tibic over here, at the BIA formulation, they're bringing data to the Congress that states that major crimes, rapes, homicides, and everything are down in Indian country 50%. So when we come for more funding in those aspects that in public safety and justice, that's why we don't get an increase because it shows there's a decrease. But once you talk to tribal leaders and you talk to people, we need to get the right data out there that helps us when it's coming to you guys to be able to help us with the funding that we need. If there's a decrease, you guys don't see a reason for an increase. So without numbers and the right numbers, we're not going to be able to fund and be able to do the things that that my brothers and, and sisters need on different reservations and also on ours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and just to follow up on that point here, you know, we, we know the numbers. We know that Native Americans, Alaska Natives, um, as, a, as a population demographically, are, are dying in the past two years of, of drug overdoses more than any other populations out there. Um, we just had a hearing in appropriations this morning on an emergency supplemental. This was the domestic. We talked about the border. Uh, several of my colleagues were, were there at committee. Um, we talked about fentanyl, and there is a significant increase in the uh, a significant provision in the supplemental for to combat fentanyl. There's $250 million directed to IHS. I'm looking at the situation in, in Indian country. I'm looking at the situation in, again, communities like Tyonic, Savunga, Dillingham, tiny little native communities that are so far off the grid, most people don't even know that they exist. And yet the drugs are coming in and they are killing people. And so we, we, have, we need this data. We need to understand how it is moving so rapidly. I think we all recognize that we've got to be doing more when it comes to treatment, but we're dealing with a drug, the lethality of which is almost incomprehensible for most people. And so when we talk about um, treatment facilities, you just can't take your, your standard five-week treatment facility and, and, and get somebody who is addicted to fentanyl and somebody who got addicted in less than a month and think that in five weeks you're going to flip this and you're going to have somebody that's now 
clean. We've got, we've got a challenge that is so big and so enormous, it's going to take exactly what you all are doing in your Lummi Nation, um, Chairman, with, with saying, as a community, we've got to wrap our arms around it. We, we pretty much have to, have to figure out how we do this from within. And so I, I, I know that resources will be a challenge. I would, I would ask the three of you as tribal leaders knowing that IHS is going to be receiving a specific increment to go towards these services, where would you specifically direct that? And give that to us in writing. I think that that would be helpful for us. Um, I want to ask Mr. Geddes about what you've been able to do. Um, you have established these three different uh, opioid treatment programs. You've got them in Juneau, you've got them in Sitka, now Klawak. Um, we know that for far too many of our communities, whether you're islanded like you are in Southeast um, or in many parts of, of Indian country where the distances are just so great that telehealth is really um, one way where we can make a difference. Um, can you, can you describe how the telehealth authority has helped to improve treatment for patients who aren't able to get to it, but also speak to the stigma part of it? Because I'm hearing more and more and more that people, they don't want to go into the behavioral health clinic because they're going to get tagged as that guy's got a problem. We all know what it is. Don't want to even be seen in there. But through telehealth, it gives you that level of anonymity um, that might help address the stigma. So, uh, Mr. Geddes, can you speak to that, please? Thank you, Senator Murkowski. Yes, as you pointed out, uh, Southeast Alaska is a group of islands, uh, spans 600 miles, very, very small native communities uh, throughout the region, and much of Alaska is the same way. Uh, with the advancement and availability of telehealth services, we've been able to create follow-up aftercare programs because once you enter into a service and maybe work on, on sobriety or, or abstaining, um, then, you need to re then you return home because people need to be part of their communities. They need to be part of their families and need to have that family kinship. Um, being able to return home and then participate in an aftercare program um, is just essential. And telehealth has been a big component of that. Not only has it allowed people to, to enter into conversations by phone or by a Teams meeting or some sort of video like this, uh, but you can then do that uh, without uh, stepping into sometimes the, uh, that stigmatizing uh, treatment facility that doesn't fit for everyone. So we've been able to see significant gains around uh, with telehealth access. It's particularly valuable here uh, throughout our expansive region. Uh, uh, we have uh, seasonal workers who need to go fishing, who need to go hunting, who need to, par to be out. And then, but uh, with telehealth, we can bring that in. We, we've also seen, and I, and I don't want this lost, um, I've heard from, from communities across Alaska that elders also have an improved ability for any sort of telehealth access. It improves healthcare, it improves and reduces disparities. Uh, so so I, I strongly support remaining and keeping telehealth opportunities as available as possible. Thank you. Um, just to our panelists, know that we are, we've been in a series of votes, so when you see us popping up and down, it's not because we're not being attentive, it's because we do have to go over and vote. That's where the chairman is now, um, and that's where I will be going when he comes back, but not for lack of attention. Senator Tester. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Murkowski, and thanks for having this hearing, and I want to thank everybody who testified. Uh, Councilman Kirk, uh, Let's say that a non-native is selling drugs on your reservation. Does the tribal justice system have the ability to arrest and prosecute them? No. So, to further clarify, you can't arrest them? We can um, work with our cross-deputization that we do have with the county. And the county then, if they have beds available, can hold them but we cannot prosecute non-natives 
in tribal court on reservations. So what happens to a drug dealer that's peddling dope, peddling fentanyl on your reservation and they get caught? What happens to them? Where do they go? Anything? Hopefully, hopefully if county has enough room, they're able to house them there. If but not, if the county does not, then you let them loose? Have to let them loose or try to find the nearest county that has a bed for them. Okay. So um, let's just talk about that problem because that indeed is a problem. What, what can we do about that? Is it simply prison space or is it a jurisdictional issue? Give us the criminal criminal jurisdiction to be able to charge them in tribal court, so we're able to hold them in our jails. Okay, is that done? Let's say somebody murders somebody. Do you have the ability to, and it's a non-native? Do you have the ability to arrest them? Now it, pertaining yeah. to now pertaining to kids and police officers. Yes, and with the VAWA, yep. we are able to. Okay, so there is a precedent that's been set here. Yes. So we uh, we need to t tweak it a little bit uh, on our end. I, I know that, that Senator Cantwell talked about um, uh, law enforcement. What, what are the barriers for you right now, the ma major barriers on the ground when it comes to law enforcement? Is it, is it FBI? Because I think we're in the same boat North Dakota's in, by the way. Is it... Uh, is it lack of BIA personnel? Is it a lack of tribal enforcement? I don't know if you guys have uh, do your own law enforcement up there or not. In Fort Peck, you do. Yeah, we're six thirty eight through the BIA, and we we control our own. And do you get do you get the money from the BIA to be able to hire the officers you need, or are you understaffed? Yes, but we're also understaffed because our people start out at twenty bucks an hour, and nobody wants to come live in northeastern Montana for twenty bucks an hour. Gotcha. So how, how much do you think it would take another? You know, right now we can use another, of course, can say 100 officers, but we'll never get it. But, right. um, you know, right now we're trying to get our pay up to $27 an hour. So that way we're able to bring more interest to our reservation. Yep. Do, you have the, do you have the funding to do that? Or does that mean you have to limit the number of officers you hire? You know, for the lack of people that we have had there and with the carryover that we had, making $27 sustainable, it, it ain't going to sustain itself for long. It's okay. just using carryover from the previous years that we were able to use. I've got you. I got you. Um, if you were sitting on this side of the rostrum, what would you do? I'd properly fund BIA to be able to help out Indian country because I would want that for every part of the nation to be able to give them the right adequate stuff to fight this and stop this from killing our people. So your number one priority would be funding for law enforcement? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. I appreciate it. I yield, I think, to the Senator from Montana. Senator Gates. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you, Senator Tester. Um, and to Chairman Schatz and Vice Chairman Murkowski, uh, thanks for this important hearing. And Councilman Kirk, you've come a long ways when you come from Northeast Montana. There's no quick and easy way to get here. Thanks for coming all the way from Poplar, no less, to be here. Uh, I know firsthand that the Fort Peck Reservation has been hit hard by massive amounts of fentanyl coming into the country. A few years ago, I was down the southern border. In fact, I spent the night from about... 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. with Border Patrol doing a ride-along. In their pickups, we get out. We literally were apprehending illegals coming into the country. That was on a Monday when I did that. I went back to Washington, D.C., and then came back to Montana Thursday night and was out in Wolf Point Friday morning of that same week. I was talking to the folks in Wolf Point, your law enforcement, and I asked, I asked the, uh, the officer there, uh, so I was on the border Monday night. Drugs were coming across the border Monday night on the southern border between Texas and Mexico. When did those drugs get here to Wolf Point, do you think? He said, sir, those drugs got here before you did. 
The ongoing fentanyl crisis is devastating. It's destroying communities, families, lives, and the Montana tribal communities are ground zero for this destruction. The Montana Crime Lab has reported a 1,000% increase in fentanyl-related overdoses since 2017, and Native Americans are suffering the highest overdose death rate by a massive margin. It's not even close. In fact, in Montana, Native Americans are twice as likely to die of an overdose than any other Montanan. The Blackfeet Nation recently had to declare a state of emergency because of the staggering number of overdoses they're seeing. Fentanyl seizures at the border are up 800% since 19, and the drugs that aren't stopped are making their way to Montana. Here's a staggering stat. Montana Highway Patrol, in the first half of 2023, seized enough fentanyl to kill 300,000 people. That's nearly a third of our entire state. This is the human cost of the open border catastrophe that's going on right now on our southern border. The crisis at the border is not a funding problem. It's not a funding problem. I was down there again just three weeks ago with Border Patrol. They will tell you we don't need more money. I mean, if they, 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 they'll take some money in terms of maybe some more personnel. They would like to get the wall built, put in other video camera surveillance systems and so forth. They'll say that's, that'd be needed. But they said the most important thing you can do is to slow the flow of the flood of people coming across the border. It's policies, policies that President Biden reversed that were working in the prior administration. This is not a political statement. It's just a fact. Law enforcement solutions are needed to combat this problem. The consequences of fentanyl use bleed into every part of our communities. And what happened, you have the flood of uh, encounters, some 8 million since the president took office, plus 1.6 million known gotaways. Known gotaways means Border Patrol seized the People coming across either physically or through a video camera, but they were not able to apprehend. We don't know who these people are. And on top of that, there's probably another 500,000 that have just come across. We have no idea. It's a massive problem. And by, the, by flooding the zone with all the, the uh, encounters, our Border Patrol is stretched and they can't stop the drugs coming across. It's a zero-sum situation. Councilman Kirk, I know this issue is deeply personal. We spoke this morning at Montana Coffee. I'd like to give you a moment to speak on how this crisis has affected you, the tribe. You told me that just in the last 24 hours, we've had more deaths to fentanyl. Councilman Kirk. Yeah, most definitely. You know, and uh, it seems like without, without Narcan, we would have one every hour. You know, there's people overdosing even right now at the moment. But with the Narcan is the one that's saving them. Mm. You know, Again, like we had a discussion this morning, talking to one of the agents that go throughout Indian country for us, lives on our reservation. You know, I, I went in and I'm like, okay, I want to learn more. What do we do? What do we do to be able to subside everything that we're going to do? And I never thought I would hear it from anybody. And the first thing he says is shut the border down. You know, give us a chance. Give us a chance to stop the flow of whatever's going on here. Because how does it make all the way from down there to a little tiny place in northeastern Montana. Mm -hmm. How do we get that there? Our in Turtle Mountain, our up in Lummi, our up in Alaska, you know, all these places are devastated with this. You know, so again, you know, it's just being able to work together to find the right answers and the right things for us to do. So that way we don't lose any more parents, mothers, daughters, grandchildren, grandparents, you know, we need to work together to be able to um, make this happen. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. And I'm out of time, but uh, I just hope we can come together with a bipartisan. There's a chance right now to actually get a bipartisan solution. We're dealing with the Israel, Ukraine, the Taiwan, and the Pacific challenges, as well as the border. This is a moment we can do something to change the policies, to slow the flow. We don't need to put more money at processing people through faster. We need to put money towards actually slowing the flow. Councilman Kirk, and then I'm done. I'm okay. Here. So, you know, we see that in Indian country. You know, we see all these billion-dollar packages going to Ukraine and going to Israel. 
when is Indian country going to matter? When are the treaties and obligations and trust obligations going to matter to us? When are one of those bills going to reach us so that way we're able to adequately take care of our people? If packages and bills can be like that, but we've been underfunded all these years on everything, when is a package going to come so we can start fighting for our people the right way? Thank you so much. Thanks, Councilman. Thank you, Senator Daines. Before moving on, I just wanted to address your point. First of all, uh, I want to acknowledge your point. Uh, generations of disinvestment, disenfranchisement, disintermediation of culture and language and land and water, all of it. Um, and so I don't mean to diminish the point you're making, but I do think it's worth pointing out that this committee, both through IIJA, through the various COVID relief bills, and through IRA, made the biggest investment in Indian country and Native communities in American history. So both things are true, that we did that, and also that it's not nearly enough. But I, I did think it was worth pointing out that we've made a down payment in a way that is historically unusual. Again, doesn't solve anything, but it is um, the first most important step in the right direction. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I too agree. I, I think we have to do an all of the above approach to address fentanyl that's not only coming into all of our communities, but our tribal communities uh, and address the needs there. Uh, I think it is important. Uh, and I, I want to talk about one of them is the law enforcement piece of it because I see it in my tribal communities. But before I do, I, I have to address um, some of the conversation here from some of my colleagues. You know, there is a comprehensive approach. We could work in a bipartisan way to address what's happening at the southern border. It's something I worked on as an attorney general to address the drug trafficking. And what I hear from those on the border is additional funds to help the, that drug trafficking. And that's why the current president, in his supplemental, has actually requested from Congress for $849 million for the procurement of non-intrusive inspection systems to make sure that cars and trucks are being scanned and can counter illicit drug activity, including that fentanyl and human trafficking. The president is also requesting $4.4 billion for Customs and Border Patrol to be able to hire additional agents and officers to make sure that the criminals and traffickers can't get into the country. There's additional funding he has also put in to address the migrant flow, to really focus on this issue. This is part what I think is all of the above approach, all of the above, because I, I'm here to tell you, as somebody who worked to fight these transnational criminal cartels, you can shut down the border, but that's, those drugs are going to find their way another way, ports of entry, other ways in, and, and unless we're doing an above, uh, all of the above approach, we're really not going to make a dent in this. That's why I, sub I support Haida. I support law enforcement. I support our tribal communities, helping them really address the gaps that I see in some of the cross-jurisdictional issues that we have. I see in my own tribes, I was just with Fort McDermott Paiute Shoshone tribe, which is on the Nevada-Oregon border. They, can't eat, they don't have enough resources to even hire tribal police, right? We know that. Some of our communities don't even have tribal police, so they have to rely on BIA. Well, that one BIA agent has to cover a region the size of Nevada and other territory. And there's only one or two of them, let alone one FBI agent and very few, maybe one AUSA to, to, to prosecute at a federal level. That's ridiculous. That's where we come in as well. I think at a federal level, it is important for us to really focus on how we address the BIA issue, to support and supplement what our tribes already, if they have the ability to, to hire tribal police, but those that don't, we are actually have adequate law enforcement in those communities. And that's where we really have to come together in this committee to, to, to focus on what's necessary. Um, I, I will tell you, there's 28 tribal communities in Nevada, and, and as a former attorney general, I worked with them. One of the things that we did was enter into memorandums of understanding between federal, state, and local law enforcement because of the cross-jurisdictional issues, because of the lack of law enforcement in some of our tribal communities. And I understand, Councilman Kirk, you, you've done something similar with a cross-deputization, right? So how, what, what are the benefits that you see of that cross-deputization? And if you would talk a little bit about that, if that helps address some of the gaps in services until we fix those. Yeah, most definitely. You know, the cross deputization is with the county, uh, the Montana Highway Patrol, and also the city of Wolf Point. Um, you know, and it works really great, you know, to have more boots on the ground, to be able to combat more, to be able to um, have other people fighting 
because right now our tribal cops are in the major cities like Poplar and Wolf Point. And on the outer communities, we also have a, a MOU with Valley County also. So they're able to cover Valley County covers our West End and also Roosevelt County covers our East End. So we're able to implement different things, but also implementing like a security program back home to be able to help us alleviate, um, you know, different parts of it. So, yeah. Thank you. And and, and I'm going to ask maybe Chairman Azure, talk a little bit about some of the challenges people don't realize is they think if you have maybe three or four BIA officers, that's going to be enough. But they forget that there's a large territory to cover places like Nevada and in the West. Uh, there's, there's a lot of coverage, uh, travel time between some cities where uh, unfortunately a lot of illicit activity can occur. If you want to hide somewhere, you're able to do it because of the lack of coverage. Do we, do you see that, um, in, in, in your area, uh, in your state and in, in your community and your tribal nation as you're working uh, with the state and feds as well. I, I'm curious if that is a part of a barrier that we, we need to deal with as well. In the Turtle Mountains, we are a unique demographic. We are a, a, a smaller land base, but we have a large uh, population. They call it the old six by 12 uh -huh. with our land base back home. Uh, but we have over 14,000 people living on or right off that uh, six by 12 on our reservation. Uh, sometimes that's, that's where the frustrations with the details come into play. Sometimes we are down to two officers on the weekends. And that's a major misconception with people where they think that the bad guys aren't very smart. Bad guys are smart and that's why they prey on reservations because they know the red tape, they know the bureaucracy, they know that if they make a phone call saying that there's an issue on the southeastern side of our reservation while the drug bust or the drugs are being transferred onto the northwest side of it, there are how many people in that 45 minute drive that they are driving by or how many phone calls are coming in. So they know what they're doing. And it's a, it's another major misconception that this is only happening on tribes. It isn't. It is happening in small town America. There is a microscope over the top of our tribes because of who we are. And they know the red tape and they know how to get away with things. And it, it, as an attorney general, you know that there was a number that some of the states have where you have to hit $50,000 to prosecute on a drug charge. $4,999 is what people will be caught with. So it's uh, there are so many issues and that's why it needs to be a joint partnership of everybody working together and taking down that bureaucracy and taking that red tape down and figuring out a way of how are we going to protect that next generation not only tribes but the citizens of this great country yeah thank you and i know my time is up but i'm hopeful uh, mr chairman uh, really i i I think when I first got here, we may have had a conversation around this, but it is time for us to have another conversation about uh, how how we fund BIA along with our, our U.S. attorneys uh, and FBI as they coordinate and our partners uh, with our tribal communities and our local communities as well. I, I just, I, I don't think we're doing a, a service here to really address what we are hearing that is happening in our communities right now. And uh, I think it's time for us to to revisit that conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Cortez Masto. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Cortez Masto, for those great questions. And thanks to all of you for being here. I'm so glad to be with you. Um, so, you know, as I was listening to all of this, I'd start by first, we have a, I want to talk mostly about the, um, the criminal problems that we have around um, drug trafficking, but I, I also just want to acknowledge that we also have a severe mental health crisis, um, behavioral health crisis that um, we need to be looking at as well. And um, that's because to my mind, um, substance use disorder is a, is a disease. It's not, you know, the, the, the fact that you have that is a, is a health challenge that needs to be addressed. And I want to just note that, um, I mean, there are just so far too few resources and tools available to address that and to address it in the context of the generational trauma and um, that we know is driving um, so much of that. Um, you know, there is a very important piece of um, um, legislation that we passed called the Native Behavioral Health Access Improvement Act. Okay, so this, this is legislation that is built on something that we passed, which is the, um, the special diabetes program. And modeled on that special diabetes program is this behavioral health program that would um, allow 
for tribes to be able to use their best knowledge and their um, sovereignty to be able to understand how to put together programs that are going to be able to address those um, um, uh, that mental health challenge. So I want to just draw attention to that because I think it's important. Um, but this crisis is also, as we've been hearing from many of you, the result of this legal quagmire where drug traffickers, ex they exploited, as you're saying, um, as you're saying, uh, Chair Azur, to keep opioids flowing into tribal communities without any accountability. So take the Red Lake Nation in northern Minnesota. Um, Minnesota is a... Um, Public Law 280 state, Red Lake Nation is not under Public Law 280, so it's a closed reservation. And what happens there is that they repeatedly pick up the same drug traffickers who are not native, they then take those folks to the border, those folks are then picked up by county or federal law enforcement, and a week later, those folks are right back there again doing exactly the same crime. It is a revolving door that there is no end to and no accountability for. So. This question of how to address the need for criminal jurisdiction on tribal lands is important, and we've you know it's it's gotten a lot more complicated following some of these Supreme Court decisions that we're that we're dealing with. And as we as you have been saying, um, those complications have been exploited um, by uh, these um, criminal networks that are trafficking fentanyl and other drugs. So I'm going to. Um, maybe I'm going to ask this question to you, Chair Hilari, because I think that Senator Cantwell was getting this at, at this a little bit. Um, can you, if you think about what we accomplished with that special criminal jurisdiction for missing and murdered Indigenous people um, on reservations, so that there was that you had that special criminal jurisdiction? Can you speak to how that has been working? What you see as the the strengths of that, and anything that we can learn from what we could do if we were able to extend it to um, drug trafficking, for example. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's, uh, that's a great, great idea. And uh, I just want to add on to, to some of the things that you, you mentioned. The, um, uh, we were reminded by, uh, by some of our elders that this mental health crisis and fentanyl crisis is one and the same. Right. And so um, it, it, it is a holistic, comprehensive approach that is needed to, to address it. And I, I also... Uh, you mentioned two weeks that somebody is uh, taken to the border, handed over to other jurisdiction, and then you see them two weeks later. Well, for us, try two hours later. Yeah, uh, We've went to, uh, we're a sovereign nation, and we have to do what is in the best interest of our people. And so when we, when we go to a, a drug known drug home where there's known drug activity, known drug dealing, and we get them off of the reservation. I do want to mention we also have MOAs with our, our county as well, which allows us to mm -hmm. at least uh, uh, enforce, but then we hand them over to uh, the county authorities, and then uh, two hours later they are hitchhiking back onto the reservation, and it's an ongoing, ongoing issue. So I, I think that, that would be an absolutely great idea, uh, that along with our ability to, um, uh, if there's a way we can, I have special prosecutors that we can prosecute ourselves because mm -hmm. uh, that's another big barrier is that uh, we uh, uh, can federal uh, prosecute them federally, but you know who's going to take up a case for something that is right. could be seen as a small you know crime compared to the vast amount of, of crime that, that can happen in this world. Uh, so I, we, we would be fully uh, supportive of something like that. Uh, it would just be a matter of uh, narrowing down the, uh, the details of how that would work with um, VAWA. Yeah, um, I really appreciate that. We are working on legislation to accomplish that, and I think that the the the, the feedback that you're giving us, which is you need we need resources to be able to um, do the um, accountability, but we also need jurisdiction. As we and we've learned from VAWA, we've learned from that from the, from the extensions that we did in VAWA how that can work, and I think we should put that learning into action. Thank you, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank everyone for, for being here again um, today. Um, one issue, Mr. Chairman, I want to raise before I get to my questions is um, in New Mexico, thousands of tribal members over the last couple of years have fell victim to extensive sober home Medicaid fraud schemes where people were being kidnapped and driven 100 miles away into the state of Arizona under the false promise of treatment, left there without means to return home, left homeless 
when they were at their most vulnerable state. And while this has been tragic, not just to the families, but to everyone that has paid attention to this, to the entire community, it also highlighted the extreme need in communities to have more treatment. And I very much appreciate the, the conversations being had today in, in all spaces, especially the line of questioning coming from Senator Cortez Masto and Senator Smith. I certainly agree with, with their assessments. Now, Councilman Kirk, it's my understanding that um, there is a presence of a treatment facility on your tribal lands um, to help reduce overdose deaths and overall substance use disorder. Is that facility making a difference? You know, right now we're with the facility, we're waiting on uh, sprinkler systems and also with it being a, a old residential place, we have to do commercial water, commercial sewer. So that continues to back up. Um, there is 12 beds down at the bottom of it. So right now what's going on in Montana is that throughout the region of the Rocky Mountain region, tribes that cover Montana, Idaho and Wyoming, um, there's a regional healing center right now that's that's been going right now that we're starting to start from the ground up and working on it, trying to get a 62 bed facility. Uh, right now, I believe it's about $28 million to get it going, um, but that's for all the tribes. So if, if we're able to you know get funding with that and, and also bring the holistic healings and everything that need to happen with that, that would be great. But as for this facility back home, it has not been going for the past five years. Thank so that you. facility needs help. Yep. And so let me ask the question differently, Councilman. Will more treatment facilities closer to home make a difference? Yes, because we also, all the way in northeastern Montana, have victims of being left down in Arizona, and we're still continuing to fly them back as of yesterday. Yeah. We, we got a woman back and paying for her luggage and everything to get back home. So we are also um, subject to that, too. So I appreciate that, Councilman. Now, Dr. Soto, in your written testimony, you discussed a study you authored on medications for opioid use disorders and in Indian health clinics. Were these IHS clinics urban Indian organizations or tribally run clinics? Dr. Soto, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you repeat the question, please? In your written testimony, you discuss a study you authored on medications for opioid use disorders in Indian health clinics. Were these IHS clinics, urban Indian organizations, or tribally run clinics? Yes, they were urban uh, Indian health clinics and tribal, so tribally, tribal health programs and uh, urban Indian health clinics as well throughout the state of California, as California does have over 50 um, Indian health clinics in the state. From your research, how available is culturally competent treatment for American Indians and Alaska Natives in the IHS system, in the UIO system, or in other clinical settings? Yes, um, it's offered, and I really want to advocate for the need for more of culture being integrated into our programs. Um, I can't stress it enough. Uh, I'm a behavioral health scientist working with our tribal communities, and I have just learned in engaging and talking with them that culture really is the foundation of our Native people. It's been there before colonization, and it's still strong and alive today. And it really has what kept our people um, resilient against systemic racism, structural violence, all the things that we are, are talking about. And these are really essential to be able to help our communities recover so it's good for prevention as well as recovering because without this, people in recovery need these cultural ways to heal. There's so much unintended, there's so much, there's so much grief and there's so much healing in our community as I've heard many say today. And so there's a lot of untended grief. Like we need more of that and more of that healing. So having our traditional ways, and that may be very different for many of our different communities, you know, drumming, dancing, song, traditional ceremonies, bringing in our community, our elders. And one of the other things that we've learned is it would be great as they're advocating to approve you know, reimbursements by tribal clinics for the cost of traditional healing ser uh, services, healers themselves, or these services to help bring them into these um, programs. So they have them, but it's it's takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of um, time, but to have those would really help support because culture is um, essential. And as many have said, culture is prevention and culture is the way of life. And Dr. Zoto, the data that I've seen 
shows that this works. I mean, I, I think that as it's once it's something I fully support, and I've seen work, um, uh, especially with lessons I've learned from leaders on the Navajo Nation. Um, so I'm hopeful we can find a path forward there. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I, I do have one question that is technical to Dr. Soto, and it's about purchase referred care coverage for AIAN patients living outside their service area. Does does that present an obstacle to accessing uh, medication assisted treatment to Matt? I guess it just depends on who has it, but that purchase referred care um, is is additional funding. It's never enough. Sometimes one person can take that entire cost as they may need that to help support their travel or for them to support their rehab, to support the service that they need that may not be offered at that clinic because every clinic is obviously very different. Not Some are not specialized in certain services. And so that is really important for us to think about. So I really appreciate that comment because um, more funding needs to go within that as well because, yeah, it's not quite reaching all of our communities, our individuals, when support is needed. Thank you for that very much. And Mr. Chairman, I do have other questions. I'll submit them into the record. But just to reiterate from what Senator Smith and Senator Cortez Masto said, associated with resources to the Bureau of Indian Affairs to be more supportive as well in planning and jurisdictional questions, um, I hope that there can be time for us to have a conversation about uh, cross-commissioning and MOUs. In New Mexico, I constantly hear that liability is an issue where there's an unwillingness sometimes to enter into these agreements, and I don't understand that. But if, if that is an impediment, then what can be done through the Bureau of Indian Affairs or others to address those issues so that we have more eyes, more ears, more people on the ground to keep us safer? Um, I, was always, I always felt safer when there were more patrols through where I lived as opposed to fewer patrols living adjacent to Nambe Pueblo and Puake Pueblo and uh, in the communities where, 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 where I live and where, where I, I have the honor of visiting, um, those constraints are, are making it less safe for people as opposed to more safe, not, not supporting that. And then lastly, with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, as more conversations are taking place specific to law enforcement, I certainly hope that we can gather and have a much larger conversation about the Bureau of Indian Affairs being uh, supportive of sovereign nations as opposed to punitive in many areas. I think the times have definitely grown and moved and matured from the inception of the Bureau of Indian Affairs as we look to what, what that could become to provide more support to um, our sovereign um, nations and to our brothers and sisters. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all again for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Lujan. And just on the particular um, uh, line of questioning you had around fraud, um, I'd be happy to work with your staff on anything that we can do to, to follow up and uh, make sure there's accountability, but also prevent it um, going forward. So thank you for that. Um, my first question is for um, Dr. Seabury, and it's a, I guess it's a bit of a broad one. Um, I'm always cautious to use words that people outside of a hearing room might not understand. And I want to put a fine point on what do we mean by culturally competent care? I mean, I think I know, but I want to describe both as a concept, but also maybe, Dr. Seaberry, you can give me an example in the Native Hawaiian community of what that actually looks like. Model for the question, it's actually a favorite opening conversation for me. I usually use the phrase culturally mindful care instead of competent. Competent sounds like you take a class and you get certified and you check off and you have your papers. Um, and when it comes to being relevant and responsive to a native community, like the native Hawaiian community, um, the needs are dynamic. So in, in this moment in time, so if we're talking about 2023 culturally mindful or culturally competent care, there's probably sort of two domains of knowledge. So if you're talking about a regular um, health provider, like a primary care physician or a behavioral health provider, then the aspects of what they would need to know to be culturally competent or relevant for working with a Native person might include specifics such as an awareness of what are the contemporary issues facing our community today. So why, um, related to our worldview um, and our emphasis on our connection to land and water, for example, why are we having so many conversations about uh, water use and access, Why? what are the current stressors and common issues that face this community right now um, related to housing and water that are unique to their, to, to their history and situation currently socially as Native Hawaiians. So I would say part of cultural competence 
is knowing about contemporary issues. And then the second piece, which is I think more foundational, is an understanding of how our his shared history as a people and values show up in the way that we engage in a room. So for example, there's lots of research that shows that um, in primary care situations, health providers interrupt their patients after about 15 seconds of saying what's wrong. Um, when we look at cultural understandings of that, we see Native Hawaiians, um, like many other Native people across the country and then other, other represented groups, um, they, they, come, they wait until they're sicker before they come because they've had more experiences where they're bouncing off of the health system, feeling that they were not seen, that they were criticized or scolded, that assumptions were made about them because of their the group they belong to, that they don't care about their health, for example. And so engagement doctor, strategy- Doctor, let me just interrupt because I, I have a very specific question here. So how does that differ from just being kind and nice and respectful? Yeah. I do think it differs, but I, I want you to put a fine point on, because what, what you're describing Absolutely. is someone who interrupts their patient, which should be bad in any context. Can you Absolutely. help me? To, okay. Yeah. Yes. So specifically, so yes, in general, good Western care is great. Here's the thing. It's not just that part. So it has to do specifically with assumptions that are made about the person and what are the um, aspects of their life that are um, helpful. So there are discrimination that we can talk specifically about, about assumptions about, for example, income, where you live, biases about your diet and what you might be doing that affect the quality of the care that they're then provided. So yes, when we're talking about patient engagement, we're not just talking about being warm, receptive, sort of general trauma-informed approach, although that's very helpful. Um, we're talking specifically about recognizing that every instance of engaging with the health system without these modifications of cultural competence and awareness can re-traumatize members of the Native Hawaiian community because of the assumptions that are made about them that then make them not want to seek help in the future. So they don't, they're not able to access it. And when they do, the assumptions that are made about them impact the quality of the care they then receive. That's the issue with respect to competence, in my opinion. Um, and the assumptions are, I don't want to repeat a bunch of stereotypes with a microphone on, but the, the assumptions are some series of assumptions that the right, that health, health, right. And, and, that it's yeah, their I'll fault. Yes, yes, that, that these um, behaviors are their fault, that they must come from a violent family, for example, or that they um, are unemployed or don't have secure housing because of a lack of effort, knowledge, education, or wisdom on their part. Um, there are also assumptions that are made, you know, and so, so in many ways, I think that the sort of lack of, a rec lack of recognition of what are the current systemic factors that impact health far beyond whether or not you took the medication I told you to take um, is, is vital when we're talking about Native communities because there's, you know, 90% of health has nothing to do with how you engage with the health system. Um, and so access to safe sidewalks, street lights matter, um, law enforcement in your community, how many fast food joints and, and liquor stores are in your community versus um, libraries and, and, and farmers markets. Those things affect health in ways that then the individual person seeking help bears the responsibility for in the bias of the provider. So their assumption is that they're not eating healthy foods because they don't want to, rather than because they don't have access. Thank you so much for that. And uh, just one final request to all of the testifiers, and this is, um, you know, it's not mandatory because some of you may have access to data and some of you not. Um, I do think it's important that this hearing establish a record of the efficacy of culturally uh, mindful care, um, because part of what we have to do, this is what we had to do with the Native Hawaiian education and health, and what we've had to do with immersion uh, schools, is that we had to prove that meeting people where they are culturally actually gets you better outcomes, even if you have entirely Western metrics. You're still gonna get better you know, test scores, attendance rates, graduation rates, medical outcomes, if you meet people where, where they are. And I think there's a tendency in the medical establishment, in the you know, um, executive branch of various uh, federal and state administrations, that this stuff is not backed up by hard science. And I think that's wrong. But it would be great if we could be at least a little bit of a repository of the record that demonstrates this is the most efficacious way for us to deliver care so that we can translate some of that cultural competency into the kind of Western analysis that 
basically enables us to get more money for the, for the project. So uh, I appreciate all of your work. Um, I appreciate um, the challenges in front of us together in fighting fentanyl, but also just generally uh, in trying to keep our community safe and, and healthy. Um, if there are no more questions for our witnesses, members may also submit a follow-up written questions for the record. The hearing record will be open for two weeks, and I want to thank uh, all of the witnesses, both online and in person, for their time and their testimony. This hearing is adjourned.